Action Garda Commissioner Drew Harris appears before the Justice Committee. I have a huge amount of work to do, and part of that work is the response to a uh, response to this. And so I have no intention whatsoever of resigning. From tasers to stronger sprays and water cannons, our panel discussed some of the extra resources being sought in the aftermath of the riots. Plus, the government has been cautioned that there may not be sufficient accommodation for asylum seekers and refugees by the end of the week. We debate the next steps. Tasers, training and timelines, Drew Harris faced stiff questioning by the Oireachtas Justice Committee as he reaffirmed his intention to remain on as Gartha Commissioner, detailed a timeline for the Gartha response to last week's riots and elaborated on some of the extra resources the Gartha are now looking for. The provision of stronger and capacitance spray to all Gardaí, the provision of 200 tasers for deployment to public order units, the procurement of two water cannon, the addition of uh, smaller round shields to public order units, expand and enhance the public order fleet, run a separate proof of concept project involving the deployment of body-worn cameras in the Dublin city area. We want to accelerate the expansion of the Garda dog unit. We want to purchase handheld video cameras for public order units. Lastly, an increase in the Garda data scientists uh, to support the analysis and identification of evidential material. Well, joining me now to discuss this further is Fine Gael Minister of State, Jennifer Carroll McNeil, Labour spokesperson on justice, Aona Reardon, Independent TD, Michael Healy Ray, and executive editor of the Daily Mail, John Lee. You're all very welcome along to the programme tonight. Uh, Drew Harris, he was going to be under pressure, wasn't he, in front of an Oireachtas committee today, nearly a week since the multiple uh, stabbings outside a school and the ensuing riots in Dublin city centre, John. He talked about the need to evolve tactics. How did he perform, do you think? Um, if you were watching him and wasn't aware of what had gone on for the last few months, you would have probably thought he did OK. But unfortunately, he was defending the indefensible. So there was a load of proposals about things the commissioner would like to do after a series of uh, catastrophic failures in, in Garda management. Uh, nobody, I think, wants to criticise the rank and file Gardaí who do their best. And they protected Michael Healy Ray, as we know, a number of month, months ago. At the last collapse in uh, policing in our state, and it was almost as if there was um, uh, there was an element of unreality about the committee. I sat at most of it today, where the commissioner seemed not to accept that there's been a mm. there's been a catalogue of failure. So he spoke about these things, which frankly they were the very definition to me of of, of closing the stable door after the horse has bolted. And I think he is under he will remain under severe pressure. There's a phrase in Fleet Street when there's when when there's when there's trouble in newspapers that deputy heads must roll. Uh, at the, when you speak to the um, members of cabinet as they did today, they say they're firmly behind uh, um, Justice Minister Helen McEntee. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm surprised at that. She's going to survive. Someone's going to have to pay for what has gone on in this country for a year now when it comes to failures in policing. And I think it'll be Drew Harris. Um. On this, Jennifer Carroll McNeil, um, a defence of, of, of Garda actions on the day, of the strategy they employed. We heard a full timeline of how the protests, I suppose, escalated um, from, from the, 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 the stabbings and then, you know, the gathering outside the Garden of Remembrance, then this crowd that gathered and, you know, the, uh, by the Lewis tracks and how it all developed into what was really a city out of control by the night. Should he have accepted some portion of responsibility as that uh, as Garda Commissioner? I, look, I think everybody has to accept responsibility for something that was absolutely a disaster for Dublin city centre. But Although I think he didn't do that today. The, the events leading up to that were two things that have never happened before and certainly never happened together. A stabbing of that kind outside a school, a Garda trying to preserve the crime scene, trying to prefer, preserve evidence, which is fundamental to any investigation. And then, as you have said, the building events that happened alongside that. And I mean, there has been an approach which is to try to dampen down the 
activist element, whatever we want to call it, uh, element. Um, I think this now is a line in the sand in terms of that reproach and there has to be a very direct uh, response to that and a much more forceful response at an earlier stage. So taking taking lessons from that, I'm not sure that Drew Harris said that were they going, they're going to take lessons. They certainly talked about, um, you know, evolving their tactics here. Um, were you expecting something more from the Garda Commissioner today well, in terms of you know, dealing with a lot of the criticism that's out there over the handling of this. I think everybody should accept criticism and evolve and learn lessons. I mean, how else do we, how do we get, how do we improve things at all? Uh, I think, you know, he had said the day after that there would be a review of how things had worked. I think he came into the Iraq this then today and set out a plan for the future and it clearly focuses on a stronger respo- response at an earlier stage. So to my mind, that's a development, that's a lesson learned. You can call it whatever you like, but to me, it's a different way of approaching it for the future. It's a focus on making making sure that the Gardaí have the more f- forceful responses available to them at an earlier stage and being prepared to engage and to use them as, as has been proved to be necessary. All right, so what we were hearing, um, Aon, was a plan of action, including stronger pepper spray, expansion of the public order mm-hmm. unit, water cannon to be made permanently available, 200 tasers, um, and we'll have to get a little bit more elaboration on, on, on I suppose, gar the use of tasers to date and, tw- and where we are with that. Is this how we make our city safer? Uh, no, uh, because we need Gardaí to be able to, you know, use whatever materials that was listed there, and many of those materials are not going to help unless we have a full-scale riot again. Um, the, the commissioner came in to, to the committee really on the back foot because, look, only last month we had a serious threat of industrial action from Angarda Shiakana. They were threatening not to do overtime every Tuesday in October. There was a motion of no confidence in the Garda Commissioner, which uh, obviously you know, damaged, damaged his reputation uh, to a degree. Uh, there, anybody who you know, observes how Garda you know, should be managed from the AGSI to the GRA are saying that you can't police a city on overtime, and we have unprecedented numbers of people resigning from this force. And these are people who are, who are leaving, okay. uh, retiring early. I mean, we've had 116 up until the end of September. And also today, he wasn't in answering Alan Kelly, my colleague, in terms of the number of recruits this year into Temple Moor. He wasn't able to give a figure. The government have said it's between 700 and 800. Okay, it turns so out it's 633. Okay, so you're talking about, um, I suppose, the, the, the guard, the resourcing issue, I, the burnout I, that's there, I, I the don't numbers think leaving proper, the force. There's not on, a on the very matter, though, recognition uh, of the morale problem within Angarda Shikon. On, on the matter, though, just to go back um, to uh, the riots and the guard, the response mm. um, on the day to that, um, what we heard um, from Jennifer on this is that you know you know we can they are evolving their tactics that lessons have been learned that this was a line in the sand. Would you accept that this strategy now, um, when they talk about you know I suppose beefing up the public order unit, bringing in the tasers, um, is is something to be welcomed? It's, it's it's all about after the fact. We're not talking about community guardy. We're not talking about community relations on the ground. We're not talking about numbers of the force and. There was an absolute break up, breakdown of law and order last Thursday. And it, it, the timeline is actually really unfortunate because the commissioner didn't accept that the Gardaí had lost control of the situation by half four when a Lewis was prevented from moving uh, for, you know, through its course. The, the public order unit, the first one came on the scene at two o'clock. The second one came on the scene at six o'clock, between half four and six o'clock. It had been completely lost to the city centre and it wasn't regained until 10 p.m. And it's very hard to have to have a credible sort of uh, excuse that, you know, the, that, that things weren't lost until later in the evening. And I would say this much, Claire, right. it appeared that those who were organising the, pro- the, the protests or the, uh, or the violence were better at organising it than the Gardaí were in terms of organising the response. All right, I just want to have um, a listen now to what a Fine Gael senator um, had to say today. He was addressing the Shannad, that was Sean Kine, on the matter of the Garda response. Uh, we can have a listen to him now. They are fully in support of the Garda and feel that the only response that people involved in this sort of criminality and writing uh, understand is a good, honest, decent beating. And I'll be blunt about it. You probably cannot say that, but I'd be blunt. That's what people want to see. Is that what people want to see? Is that what grassroots Fine Gael people want to see, Jennifer? 
I think they don't want to see the city being taken over. I think they don't want to see looting and criminality. I think they do want to see a strong response, but a strong and happen. appropriate response. And it did happen. And we just heard from Aon there and talking about... Gaon said uh, there the, the, about the, it the, wasn't the a lag. focus. We were focusing on forceful responses and not community guardie. It's not an either-or sort of thing. Yes, 633 new recruits have come into Templemore this year with more to come in December. 151 are going to attest on December the 15th. And actually, it was supposed to be January, but they're coming out into service on the 15th of December to try to get more Gardaí out onto the streets. <clears throat> so it is about more Gardaí. It is also a focus on community Gardaí. That's certainly my there's focus locally. There's a huge lag though, And there, there is there, a focus a on There's a huge improving. lag in this. Like we've, we've talked about and this discussion has been had since like pre-pandemic about, you know, Gar the burnout and unhappiness in the force. At all levels, we're hearing it from the AGSI, we're hearing it from the G- GRA. Um, they're not necessarily happy with the response that they got um, or the, 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 the what happened in front of the Justice Committee today and certainly they're not hearing enough from the Justice Minister as far as they're concerned. That's what we've heard from Antoinette Cunningham of the AGSI. I mean, are are we talking about just a a failure here that at at the bottom line is that Gardaí are not happy and they don't feel satisfied that they can operate safely to manage or control or de-escalate riots? What do you mean specifically? I mean, specifically when they're talking about their ability to act and act with force, they don't know if they can even do that. And that's a discussion that we heard from Helen McEntee mm. saying today, we have to review what Gardaí are able to do in these situations. Well, I think it was, the, I mean, the Commissioner and the Minister have been clear in relation to that, and it is a training issue, but I think it is also Gardaí have felt under pressure in relation to this. They have felt under pressure around GSOC, the investigations. It is really appropriate that we have an independent complaints mechanism, but it is true that Gardaí have been worried and that that has been building, and you can hear that is anecdotally. That management? And you can hear that anecdotally. Uh, whatever the reasons are, Gardaí need clarity. I mean, these our Gardaí are the people who are protecting us at all time. They need to know what they can do clearly at any stage well, in whatever the response happens to be. And that is an evolving, that is an evolving uh, practice as well. well uh, Michael, I'm sorry, just to bring you in on all of this, and um, we heard today as a, a, a defence um, from Joe Harris, but also um, saying that the force does need to evolve to this situation and to how it manages and responds to it. Well, first of all, it appears to me that the only two people in Ireland that were taken by surprise of the events of last week were the Commissioner and the Minister for Justice. They seem to have been completely oblivious to the fact that this hate group have been growing. It, it's a well-known fact. Everybody knows that this has been gathering momentum. And uh, there was something very weak about seeing a Commissioner who 97 or 98% of the Gardaí said they didn't have confidence in him a very short length of time ago. And to see him coming in to an Oireachtas committee today, giving his views as to how he's going to improve uh, the lot, we'll say, of the Gardaí, we need to give Gardaí the confidence again to do their work. When you see people being attacked, Gardaí being attacked, and they being afraid of retaliating to defend themselves and to defend the state, that's ridiculous. We have to go back to a situation where guards aren't afraid, for example. And what do you put that down no, to? Because well, we've heard of the difficulty, it, say, that, that guards, they feel pressure the, from the, the, the guard, the ombudsman, who yes. are there for a specific reason. The activities to, of to, G- to look for of oversight G-Sock. of the guards, which I think people would welcome. But yes. is there a failure then at leadership level to kind of establish what Gardaí do in this situation and to get all hands on deck and to do it in a very managed way, which appears what we're hearing from the DRA and others, simply wasn't the case last week. Excellent Gardaí who have been doing their job in the the past have found themselves being investigated as if they have done something wrong. All they were doing was doing their job. We have to ensure that the guards will be confident going out, going on duty, that they won't be put under the microscope if they just quite simply do their job. We have to empower them again. And if it wasn't for the excellent work of the GRA in representing their membership, that the commissioner himself, like the reason he didn't win a popularity competition with the guards was quite simply because he seemed to be putting the guards under attack okay. instead Are you of joining leading calls? Them. Are you joining calls for... Uh, the Garda Commissioner to resign, to not be in his position, and 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 Justice Minister Helen McEntee, where do you stand on her position? I'll deal with the Commissioner first, since he has taken up the position in the first instance. In my opinion, he hasn't crowned himself in glory. That's a polite way of answering you and saying, no, I have the exact same amount of confidence in him as the 98% of the Garda he had, and that was none. Okay. 
All right. Um, John, on this, we heard uh, Sinn Féin coming out the day after the ride saying uh, the positions are untenable of the Justice Minister, Helen McAtee, and of Garda Commissioner, Drew Harris. Um, after today, where do you think they stand? Well, as we all know, um, Sinn Féin are compromised on issues of justice um, because of their history. Um, whether they like it or not, it's a recent history. They haven't, they didn't take the opportunity to table a motion of, of no confidence. I, I, um, they probably will, but that will back, probably backfire on them when you speak to government figures who, who want to then put on the, on the record of the doll the record of Sinn Féin on, 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 um, on justice matters. But events we've had this year would indicate in the run-up to Christmas when there is a lot of revelry going on in Dublin city centre, when eventually the, the Garda overtime that's going to be used in the coming weeks runs out, people get tired. They can't sustain the, the manpower they have in the streets because we don't have enough man, manpower in Garda. There will be another instant before, uh, instance um, before Christmas. I, I'm just looking at a piece here I wrote right after the, the day that um, Michael Healy Ray here was, 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 was jostled and manhandled uh, outside Leinster House. And I reported then that Garda were not only afraid of GSOC investigating them, they were they were afraid of their their superiors in the Gardaí um, investigating yeah. them. I've done a lot of work on that. So the, the Gardaí are still afraid to use mm. the, the 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 restraint they need to use, and there will be another incident. And I think then the commissioner will find himself in in a very very disadvantageous position. Okay, uh, we heard from. Um, your leader of Anabachic in the Dáil today, querying Helen McEntee on, on all of this, asking if the Garda Commissioner had offered to resign. Mm. Um, I think that was clarified know, later that, that he hadn't offered to resign. Yeah, I, I know Labour has taken issue with, with Sinn Féin calling for heads to roll, but it was pointedly brought up by Ivana Bacic today. In terms of? In terms of asking if the Garda Commissioner had offered to resign. Look, I mean, what is Labour's on, on Friday, we Should were... he be offering his resignation? Is that what... No. Uh, I'll tell you what, the, what our point is. Like, after today, look, the, 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 the Commissioner has given a report to the Minister on the events last Thursday. We want to see that report. We also want to have an independent, judge-led, if possible, report into the events as well so we can uh, assess what the failures were before Thursday uh, and afterwards. Uh, in relation to other parties and what they have said about the Garda Commissioner and the Minister for Justice, on Friday this city was traumatised mm -hmm. and we didn't feel it was politics as normal. So we didn't go down that route. That's not to say, by the way, that this story doesn't have further to go. And I don't think the Minister today or the Garda Commissioner did enough for people not to think that their positions are fast becoming untenable. And when that report is published, and I hope it will be, and when we have uh, you know, the, the establishment of an independent report into the events last Thursday, we're going to have more to You're say. You're holding fire. But, but, but uh, because, look, we didn't call for the Garda Commission to resign after the GRA ballot either, because we're trying to have some level of oversight into what is a very, very damaging and difficult situation. And there are still people in yeah, hospital, I'm just uh, uh, by I'm the wondering way, that well. when, when because uh, we, we saw the images and I think there was a video, I don't know, did you uh, show it outside, uh, outside yeah. Leinster House? Yeah, that's what, Of I mean, all the, the barricades. We saying, this, bar is a, this is a national policy. The, this is a policy failure. The, I, I feel that th things are so on edge at the moment. People feel really on edge. And so it is very, very important, by the way, that government representatives, by the way, are tempered in their language. I'm horrified that as Fine Gael Centre stood up and said that the answer to this is potentially to beat people up. And I'm also not impressed that the minister used the term scumbag today. And all, there was other antics from Sinn Féin as well, which were really, really, uh, you know, outrageous as well. Yeah, so, so, actually, maybe just to, to get you in on that, um, your I don't, thoughts I, on that, yeah. the use of, um, I drew Harris referred to thugs, um, uh, when he was talking about scumbags was something then we heard from um, no we did hear we did hear people. you referring to a gob doll now so I mean Aon you know you're not you're not averse to use no. to use of uh, language in the doll in temperate language or otherwise but like just to come back to the language and how we deal with all of this um, Jennifer your view on that and whether it's becoming increasingly divisive in who we are targeting 
I think it's a I think it's a real difficulty because people are trying to find expression for what they saw and they're trying they, people I mean like Aon I was devastated on Thursday and Friday to see my city in that situation and to see the, the attack on the children in particular but what followed that and people are struggling for language to describe going in and looting arnets and looting ASICs and looting shops in that way and taking cigarettes and runners and trying to find ways to explain that and that's a huge challenge and it's and and, and setting fire to public transport and setting fire to guard vehicles. So language is a big issue around this. It, it, it genuinely is. What about the thing that are calls going, well, why did it come to this? And look, there's an absence of community policing. Think, it, there's, there's not there's, enough there in your looking if you want to find the, the, the root enough. cause but of all of this. But community policing isn't enough. And I mean, but isn't it part of knows, the answer? It is, but it's not enough. I mean, I've worked on youth justice and guard diversion for nearly 20 years at this stage. And overwhelmingly, community policing the juvenile liaison officers, the guard youth diversion system, it really works for about 95% of people. It is an excellent system. But for the other 5%, it's not working. And I just feel that there's a, there's a cohort of people who don't don't come through that well and who move into committing significant criminality in their 20s. It's not just me saying that, it's Eddie Darcy and other people who have worked on it. And this is the public order unit and the tasers and I would come say, in. And I would say, no, that, that's in response to events. But I would say this, like in terms of a response, the focus on resignations, the focus on individuals is a sucker to people who have been agitating, particularly on the far right side. That is not the response. The response is getting the systems right. The response is making right. sure that it doesn't okay. happen again and not a focus on individuals. the situation I do, by but, calling for but, heads. Michael. No, but just on the point of the use of language, a horse is a horse. Horrible, nasty people are horrible, nasty people. Whether people want to call them thugs or hooligans or whatever you want to call them. But you can't say that there's anything good about those people who ran down the street shouting after a member of Angarda Shikana who was on duty, kill him, kill him, kill him. And in case any of your listeners didn't know that that happened, people actually ran after a fully uniformed member of our force and they're our guards. They're our people, they're our relatives, they're our relations, they're our, okay. our neighbours' relations. I didn't interrupt you. And what I'd say about that is, that can never be tolerated. And whatever right. you were going to call those people, they Is the solution name calling or is it actually well, well, what dealing we, with what, right. dealing what we, with what are we with, going to call them? Okay. We're not going to pussyfoot about right. it. Can They're I, horrible I make, human beings. Can I make a, a sort of a, a potentially unpopular point here? And I thought Lynn Rowan spoke very well at the Justice Committee in relation to this. Is that in any of these situations you have those who are leading and those who are led. And there's going to be a cohort, maybe it's small, of those who are there on Thursday night who may be able to be brought back from that situation. Now, what the far right want to say is that government wants to beat you up and they've just called you all scumbags. And the only people who are going to defend you are us. So, mm -hmm. if, so I know it's a difficult argument to make, but if you're trying to recover some of those young men from, from where they are and from what they've done, it is probably a better use of, there, there are better uses of terminology oh, and better uses of tactics. Okay, we're going to leave uh, that there for now, but coming up next, Sinn Féin is singled out by one of our guests for not helping subdue a far-right protest this summer. Do you know who wasn't there and didn't help me? The Sinn Féin. The Sinn Féin representatives locally. You're active on the ground. You had councillors in Kalini Shankill. After the break, we're joined by the Sinn Féin representative who refutes those claims. Welcome back. Well, earlier this summer, a series of protests took place in the South Dublin suburb of Ballybrack. Tensions escalated after an attack on a property believed to be earmarked for asylum seekers. Yesterday, in the Dáil, Jennifer Carroll McNeil called out Sinn Féin for their lack of support. We came together and we tried to manage this the best way we could for the, it, for the period that time, but also for the period ahead to try to manage this in the best way in the interest of everybody in the community, but also so as not to allow the far right a veto on who moves into Ballybrack. But do you know who wasn't there? Do you know who wasn't there and didn't help me? The Sinn Féin. The Sinn Féin representatives locally who are active on the ground. You had councillors in Kalini Shankill and the only people who didn't help me and didn't help Cormac Devlin and didn't help Oisin Smith and didn't help Richard Board Barrett and didn't help the Gardaí were Sinn Féin. 
Well, Jennifer Carroll McNeil is, of course, with us in studio, also joined by Aona Rirdon, Michael Healy Ray, and John Lee. And joining us tonight is Sinn Fein representative from the Kalini Shankill area, Shane O'Brien. You're welcome along to the programme tonight. Um, I want to get your reactive uh, reaction there to what uh, Jennifer had to say uh, when they were trying to quell tensions where protests blew up over the housing of asylum seekers. It was at Ridge Hall um, in Ballybrack. Sinn Fein didn't help. What do you have to say to that charge? Well, I was quite taken aback by the bizarre rant uh, last night that I heard within in the Dáil in terms of the debate on policing and the protests and, and public safety more generally. Um, obviously, Jennifer Minister Carol McNeil stated that Sinn Féin councillors weren't helping her when actually there are no Sinn Féin councillors in Kalani Shankill or indeed any other part So just part, to clarify, you're a representative, you're on the Sinn Féin team. I'm a former councillor and I'm the general election candidate for Dun Leary. Okay. Um, and in relation to not helping, and that's interesting in, in itself, but let's just say things didn't just kick off in South Dublin and Ballybrack. Indeed, there had been the opening of an asylum centre in a Blan Avenue in Dunleary a couple of months before. Um, there was a sort of series of protests outside the asylum centre. There was attacks on the asylum, on the asylum mm -hmm. centre. Uh, and there had been a number of uh, growing dis uh, concern and hate uh, right across right. Dunleary. So in terms so of in the charge that was made, and we'll hear from Jennifer yeah, again, yeah, no, it's absolute, that Sinn Féin it's, didn't help, yeah. what do you say to that? Well, Did you help? That's absolute nonsense, uh, Claire, And it's absolute nonsense for a number of reasons. See, when the charge that's made against me that Sinn Féin didn't help Jennifer or Sinn Féin didn't help Fine Gael, my job is not to help, fin is not to help Fine Gael, it's to help the people of Bally Brackets right. to help so did the you people. De de-escalate Abs the situation, the Ab tensions that were clearly Abs there in Bally Absolutely. Bally we went door to door in the area talking to people. We held meetings with people who were protesting. We t uh, went with information to try and dispel some of the myths that some far right agitators, not even from the area, were coming in and spreading around uh, Bally Brack, around Dunleary and around elsewhere within Dunleary. You didn't engage directly with um, with Jennifer or with TDs in the area? I did indeed, yes. So myself and Richard Boy Barrett, who's also a TD in the area, met with protesters. We met with people from the area, locals living in the area, mm -hmm. who had concerns, who had questions, wanted clarity. And we met with those along with councillors, uh, elected councillors and area representatives. And we went and sought answers and got answers. And then again, met with some of the people who were protesting right. to provide them with the information. Jennifer, what do you say to that? OK, I have to go through a couple of different things here. One, this or this protest was organised by a combination of the far far right elements. There's no question about that, but also a very strong local element. There was, um, and I never wanted to have to go through this, but there was a meeting organised with people whom the Gardaí identified as helping would have been able to influence the protests being called off. And the Gardaí set that meeting up between myself those individuals and Shane O'Brien with a view to trying to de-escalate the situation. That meeting was, was to be held on the 27th of July at 2 p.m. in Lachlanstown Community Rooms. Shortly beforehand, Shane and uh, met those individuals. The guard had turned up to facilitate the meeting, which was to be able to answer questions and hopefully de-escalate the situation. As I said, it was the guardie who had identified a very significant opportunity to de-escalate the protest from a local perspective, a very important ident opportunity created by the guardie, identified by the the Gardaí set up by the Gardaí and I, as I arrived in the car park a num short number of minutes before the meeting was to be held. Shane informed the Gardaí that he wasn't going to attend this meeting with me. The meeting then didn't happen. It wasn't able to be facilitated. I wasn't there able to be able to, to answer questions or to be able to deal with this. This was extremely sensitive. I never wanted to have to discuss the particular detail of this but Shane is, has, has oh, pressed oh, no. this matter well, and I, that I, was the... In, that in is fairness, the, that he is, hasn't pressed the matter. That you is, brought it up that in is, the goal yesterday yes, I, and this, made that a point is, of it. That and, and because it was important. It is okay. important. Well, and then, I went, and well, I went door to door. In fairness, I, and I, I think went the Sinn Féin door, representative in the area has, and the, I went has the right door to, to respond door to that. as well. I went door to door as well. I wrote to everybody. I was extremely public okay. in, my, in, in, in what I was trying to do. That wasn't replicated, but where my particular disappointment was where the community guardie, where the guardie more broadly, who were dealing with, where I think we were close to 10 days into protest at that point, uh, or there, thereabouts, I'd like to check that. But there was an opportunity created by the Gardaí. And what I specifically said, okay. although it cuts off before that, what I specifically said is they had the opportunity with the community Gardaí, they did not. Okay, so the this is specifically the on that meeting with, they the, did not. with the Gardaí. Yeah. 
Um, is there a reason you didn't... And instead didn't he comes show, in here and yeah, so describes I, it so, as a So I, I, I have a really good relationship with the community guardy, with the senior guard and management in, Cl- in Shankill, in Dunleary, and I've been working with them throughout the protests, not just in Ballybrack, but in, in Dunleary and, and likewise. Okay. In terms you didn't of want to show up to that particular meeting? We'd, we'd organised by the guard. We'd, you'd we'd, actually we'd, just met them, but we'd, you wouldn't meet with the guardy and myself. A bit manners, please, and just allow me to finish. In terms of the meeting, uh, we'd already met with people, and the problem was that the government hadn't been listening. No different than a myriad of issues, the government isn't listening to people. And, and they didn't trust Jennifer Carroll McNeil or any other Fine Gael representative. Right. And their role as community re- area representatives and, and activists, and no different than the TDs or the councillors mm-hmm. that were present, was to listen to people. And there were really difficult meetings. There were really difficult meetings uh, to hear the fears, the concerns, the things that people were bringing up with us, some of the language that was being used. But I also take umbrage to the fact that everyone, and, and, and in that outburst, that bizarre rant last night, that everyone in Ballybrack, and it's happening time and time again, been labelled as far right. They're not. They're, They're not, not far right. They're not far right. They're not far right. The people of Ballybrack are really good people who were incredibly upset about this protest. You know that and I know that because we, I went door to door, spoke to people. I've had meetings with a whole range of different people there. What's coming back to me still is, well, when Sinn Féin get into government, there'll be no, there'll be no international protection applicants. They'll sort it out. There was an attack on a plan. Myself and Oshin were down there the next morning right. to try to provide support, to provide detail. But I'm, you know what, I'm actually so glad sorry, we have this opportunity. Jennifer, when you say when Sinn Féin get into government. This is, is what that, I'm being fed. So, this is what so I'm you're, being told. So you're being this told being that told. Sinn Féin are giving yes. a message this to is what I'm being told. their voters this is what I'm being told. that this will now, change under Sinn This is the opportunity that, that, to clarify this, no, actually. That, that, this is that, the opportunity, sorry. I'd like just to give Shane an opportunity to clarify, to clarify this. That, that, that is not this, so. Thank you. This that is, in fact, you're not against this This is actually following on in terms of trend. So in terms of the rant last night, let's call it what it is, a rant. It was a rant to do what? To distract from the events of Thursday, the horrific attack, the stabbing of three children, a crash manager, and the subsequent riots that followed. La- ye- yesterday was a strategic rant aimed to distract from the events in Dublin. And what we're having now, and in terms of this next claim, is again another distraction tactic to the distract from the Jennifer's it's failings, Fine Gael's failings in terms okay, of housing, in terms of police, and, and then, so I'm on. Sorry, may I respond? First of all, I am entitled to set out in the doll, as you have said. Second of all, your supporters and a whole range of people on social media pointed out to me that you don't have councillors in Kleine. I said that you'd had it. I know the political representation because you and I ran against each other in Kleine Shankill, right. okay. and the outcome I, was the way you and I both at this know point, it. I just, but I, I just want to be very clear that you are, in fact, supportive of international protection applicants moving into Ridge Hall in Ballybrack should that opportunity arise. But we, you're, are, you're in, openly supportive of that, in, ter- in terms of international protection, and I want to say, I've been working in terms of integration work for over 20 years, since I was the 15 S. actually in school, uh, and I continue to do so. I've so been supportive yes. in terms of the asylum seekers in Dunleary, in terms right. of helping integrate them with communities. just on the issue that I suppose prompted all the protests in Ballybrack, where does Sinn Féin stand? Well, I think actually a letter provided by Jennifer actually stated that... Is that a yes? The, the hall, the, sorry, excuse me, Jennifer, that the centre or the place in Ridge Hall, the building has actually been destroyed because of the protest. Okay. No, it's been no. destroyed because of the protest. No, no. There, we've had families... OK. Above, no, no, no. no, sorry, one second. We've had families living above not, the proposed mm. centre that were evacuated. Families with young I, kids. I know those families. All right, so they're living in apartments adjacent to it, and it's not being done. It, it, it's, it's not suitable right now for, for housing. Because it's from, not, from my understanding, it's, it's not. And not. flooded. Okay. But it's not, it's not being destroyed. It's not being let's, destroyed. Let's broaden this out. I'm just conscious that we are speaking about one area where protests are occurring, but of course, it is not the only area around the country. And um, I, I look, to come to, to come on to the view on this, Aon, um, look, we have seen plenty of similar protests about the arrival of asylum seekers. And in Drumahair and Leitrim, it was brought up again today, I think it was brought up by Green TD Patrick Costello, asking about this um, alleged vigilante response with illegal checkpoints being set up. Um, that's the allegation that's being made, that cars were stopped and that drivers were interrogated and yeah. made to show ID over uh, a false rumour of a bus that was due to arrive in the village. Yeah. Um, is the guard the response adequate or right there? And And really, are we looking at a situation that we're likely to see more of this? I mean, there's talk about a lack of preparedness, but it's not the first protest and it's not likely to be the last. 
Well, I think governments have failed in a information stream that is necessary for the country to understand our international obligations, the numbers who are coming in, the rationale uh, behind uh, how these things are done, to tackle this whole thing about unvetted males, uh, and to show leadership in that space, because without that, it is the poison that, uh, you know, that, that'll fill the vacuum. Now, I will say this much. There are too many uh, political representatives, and some of them are in the Oireachtas, who willfully whip up uh, tensions in local areas and will use... Who are you talking about? Um, I'll use phrases uh, inter uh, linking criminality okay. to immigration as often as they possibly can. And the idea there is to encourage are local people to Are you talking about Michael? Be, I'm talking... Well, the, the rural independents are very good at it. And, and, and the point here is it's also in, 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 to ensure that people locally are fearful are fearful of the outsider. And where people are fearful, okay, that turns them very, very quickly to I just want to get, very, want very to get Michael to on that because the, the rural independents have indeed been called out in the all this week. Yeah. What's your response to that, to, to whipping up a fear um, among locals who may have just concerns about service in the area and, and, uh, and you know, <clears> other <throat> things, including population and everything else, and they may have that fear and that, that fear is then jumped upon? Well, first of all, what he's just after saying, as far as I'm concerned, I'd like for you to clarify, are, if, are you talking about me? Because I've heard you say this before about the rural independence, but what I want to say about what I would call proper concerns, if you take an example, in Killarney Town on the Mukris Road, Recently, there was a controversy over the placing of 77 people in what was deemed locally to be uh, an unsuitable place for uh, economic uh, migrants coming here uh, to be located. The simple reason is, if you take people like... Uh, asylum seekers are... No, no, they're, they're uh, seeking uh, international protection here. They're not Ukrainians. They're people coming here. Seeking who international protection. Yes, and they, they go by an awful lot of other countries to come here. Right. But I just want to make the point, the reason why Killarney is so important, those good people, Killarney is the place that has welcomed people right. for over 100 and years. And just on but what Aon is saying concerned. about the use of language the, the like reason, un the reason unvetted con male migrants. The reason they're concerned is because okay. our GPs have said, we don't have adequate services, we don't have enough doctors, we don't have enough Claire, educational uh, no, services for saying. those people. And those people who protested in Killarney, there was meetings, there were Claire. by very genuine people who have genuine concerns. Okay, I do want to get back to this, so do stay with us. We will return to it after the break. My thanks for now to Shane O'Brien who joined us. Um, but coming up, we will look at the reported accommodation shortage for asylum seekers and refugees, and we will debate the next steps. Do stay with us. Miguel's Jennifer Carroll McNeil, Labour's Aon O'Rearthon, Independent TD Michael Healy Ray, and the Daily Mail's John Lee have stayed on with me to discuss a severe shortage of accommodation for those seeking asylum in Ireland. Um, this is what we're hearing. We're running out of room for asylum seekers. Almost 1,400 international protection applicants um, have been forced into homelessness this year, according to the Irish Refugee Council. And some have found themselves without a place to stay for up to 10 weeks. And we're likely to be in a situation that that's going to worsen in the next week. So it's not a new problem at all here, John, but it's really, um, it's really coming, coming to the fore now or coming to a head, especially as we approach the cold nights and Christmas. Well, I think, as you say, it's, it, it's, it's not a new problem. We had the Taoiseach a, a month ago uh, concede that we, we just did not have the capacity to uh, accommodate another 30 or 40,000 um, Ukrainians. I know there's a, there's a difference between Ukrainians and those seeking uh, international protection. But we can't house our own population. So there, I don't, I don't know why anyone would expect that we, we could then accommodate anyone else in sufficient um, comfort when we can't look after our own people. Um, but there, there's another issue then as well, which has kind of been forgotten in all this. There was a concession by the government that they made a major mistake at the outset when, you, when Ukrainian refugees came in here, that they used 2015 legislation to give them, f uh, and the legislation says that anyone given asylum under that legislation would be entitled to all the rights that an Irish citizen is, is entitled to, welfare-wise and everything else. So it then came about, when they were looking at this, a figure where it said that 30% of people here had come as a second destination. So you believe this is why we are seeing, uh, I suppose, the, what is it? Well, I think the Taoiseach said that. 100,000 Ukrainians here 
um, and um, I think a, a jump in those seeking international protection. That's well, the, why we're seeing it. The government themselves have conceded that, that the, the, they, they have created a situation where it, it is seen as advantageous to come here. But people are also figuring out that we do not have the accommodation. There has been a row between the Department of Housing and the Department of Integration about who is going to look after people's housing because there simply isn't yeah, housing. And, that row and that's continues. inhumane to take and people that, into a country and, that and not be able is, to give them some That row is also not a new row. Um, but what do we do in this instance, um, um, Jennifer, when we're seeing a situation now that we have people homeless without a place to stay for up to 10 weeks? We've also seen the reaction and we're worried about what we saw in the riots last week, that burning of tents have already occurred in migrant camps and that we could see a repeat uh, of this situation again, especially with a growing number of people now finding themselves on the streets. And we, we certainly don't want that and we've done everything we can to try to accommodate people. I think we've found an extra 10,000 beds for international protection applicants and they are places where we wouldn't normally always house people. For example, in Black Rock, there is an old Zurich, a, a commercial building which is unused, which is currently being repurposed for up to 400 international protection applicants. So we are converting premises that we wouldn't have considered using for homeless families traditionally. These are not perfect, they are not great accommodation, but they are better than tents. And we are trying to find accommodation in all sorts of different places to make sure that people aren't in tents. But we are reaching the limit of what we can do. We have managed to find further okay, so and what, further accommodation, but we are now? signaling a li uh, Well, we will continue to try to find buildings. This one hasn't come on stream yet. We will look at further opportunities of this kind, but th this hasn't yet been, the people haven't yet been housed there. So that will take some of the pressure off once that's ready. And I do expect that in the, in the coming, you know, over the Christmas period, period into January, I do expect that to be available. So that will take some pressure off and we will continue to try to work to find buildings. Yes, but we don't have an endless and constant stream of new premises yeah. coming It does come back though to, 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 to strategy here and this criticism that has been levelled at government again and again, that there is no joined up strategy, that a lot of it has been lumped on um, Roderick O'Gorman's office and um, that, you know, we've come to this situation now that um, there is a change of tone from government well, with I, regards how many people we can take in. Think, Would you agree that there's a change I, no, of tone? I think there's and a that you're, reality you're having being expressed, an immigration have, conversation before no, now that so. you're afraid no, to have before. No, it's not about being afraid. It's about being honest. I mean, we, when we were continuing to find premises, we didn't have this pressure. We were signalling we have a pressure. We are running out of accommodation. We are trying to find more example Black Rock. Okay. Uh, and we are, we are in a practical right. difficulty and we are facing that practical challenge. Okay, could this uh, practical difficulty have been foreseen, Aon, and what would you suppose can be done now? Look, I, I, I think it's very unfair to be very un very critical of government to the response to the Ukrainian crisis. Absolutely unprecedented. It was, uh, you know, a, a war waged on, on, a, on a people and they needed our help. Mm. And we needed, to, we needed to, to, to step up because we have a historic moral obligation to do that. But I don't think uh, the modular housing, uh, uh, you know, uh, option was, was exhausted. I do feel that Roderick O'Gorman uh, was isolated, didn't get much... Uh, help from the, the housing minister. But I will say this much, and let's go back to the previous point that Michael T. Ray made. In local communities around the place, I do want to emphasise that there, there is a, a nasty link being made between immigration and criminality. And I have five quotes here I, from, from Danny Healy Ray over the past month we, linking we to immigration to criminality. Okay, and we don't have time and to read I think they should be ashamed We will come back to this that. another night. Just, I'm just conscious that um, you didn't have a right to reply on that, uh, Michael, either. We will come back to it, though, um, because that is all we have time for tonight. My thanks to Jennifer, to Aon, to Michael and to John, but from all the late team here, good night and do take care. <laughs> <laughs>